there are a few more questions that have come in. But first, I, I think that there's some information that Dr. Chris DeFonso shared concerning insects. Chris, are you on? I am on, yes. And you said something about insects and the borer. Yeah, I just wanted to point out when Kim was talking that corn borer can also attack sorghum and millet. So it's a host, uh, it has a lot of host plants, basically eats everything, but you can get really severe damage in millet. I've, I've never seen it, but it can happen. And then... Uh, Right now, uh, I've had a few calls about seed corn maggot, but the adults are already emerging. So if you do, if you run the model through the thumb and into central Michigan, the adults are, are already out. So you know that pest has done its done its bit. And I haven't had any specific armyworm or cutworm calls, but now would be the time when you would probably have bigger worms and you'd see more damage. But I I just haven't had those those calls. And that's about it. It's been very quiet from the bug world. I'm going to open it up to uh, really some questions, and I, and I see Marty is on today, and also I, I think Ricardo had a question for Aaron Burns. Ricardo, what was your question? Hey, guys. I'm here. Yeah, good morning. Yeah, I actually emailed, um, I actually sent Aaron a message already. It's because it looks like, I don't know if Aaron is still on, but it looks like uh, there is some court ruling where farmers supposedly would not be able to use Extend Max for this season just came up last night. So Ari and I, we actually don't know a lot about the information. I'm gonna share the link so people they can read that, but as of right now, there is not a lot of information. Probably EPA gonna step the, uh, and, and, and say that, and say what that actually means in the next few hours or so. Ari, are you on? I, I just read that article this morning. I also sent it to Christy Sprague. So as I kind of said, Earlier, we'll just have to read that and then see uh, what the implications are and I guess look for some direction from the state also. But that just came out, so I haven't had a chance to extensively read or learn about that yet. If that product has already been applied, is that going to be a problem for the farms, do you think, or not a problem? I mean, those are the questions I personally don't have answers to yet, given just how quickly this has come out. Um, so, I'll, I mean, maybe Christy would know more. But um, we'll have to do reading and, and start asking some questions so we can provide that information. Hi, Phil. This is Christy. Um, right now, I think if, a, if that canva has been applied, it's already been applied. So that has no implication on what that court ruling is. My guess is that you're going to have Bayer and some of the other companies that are going to be fighting that court ruling. So right now, there has not been any word from the EPA on what this actually means for this season. So um, again, you know, a lot of times we have a lot of these legal actions, so we'll have to see what that means. But I'm sure in the next few days, we'll know for sure what can happen as far as dicamba applications on those uh, extend beans for this year. So I also had, uh, there was a message in here from Marty talking about uh, HEBS gap management. Marty, are you, are you on and want to share some of that information? I know that I talked to Dennis Pennington yesterday, and he said that he was taking uh, information as far as he was checking his plots, and I, I know that they were fully headed out and flowering, so he was taking information on that. You've yeah, got so I think, I think some of Dennis's plots weren't fully out yet, just some varieties, my understanding. So probably down, obviously down south, southern Michigan are probably a lot further along. And that's sort of where the, the risk was higher a few days ago and it's dropped off um, quite a bit in, in areas of Michigan. Uh, but I put a link in there to the head scab model, so you might want to check that. But if you typically make an application or mycotoxins are a concern, a vomitoxin, then, you know, application through flowering, we've got a number of different chemistries now or, or additional ones. And I put a link in there to fungicide efficacy as well. So I know you've done a lot of work as far as trying to figure out the timing on those mm -hmm. applications and uh, how big a window do we have for guys that uh, yeah get so some rain we see them? yeah we, like from flowering about a week after flowering the efficacy really drops off pretty quick so the optimal sort of timing seems to be about four days from the beginning of flowering so somewhere in that full flowering window you know is, is sort of ideal. Yeah, so there's some links anyway in the um, in the chat there if you if you wanted to have a look at any of those. But 
just something to be aware of. And I guess with the cooling temperatures again, and, and we, I mean, around here, we certainly have had a lot of preset um, here and there. So conditions, you know, right for head scab. So I, I have had uh, a question about replant on, on corn. This was an organic field, but it was one of those things where they lost probably, oh, more than a third, maybe, maybe 30 to 40% of the stand planted May 9th, May 10th. And uh, Bruce McKellar was asking, has anybody else seen any replant that, that's taken place or has there been problems out there or not? Anybody seen anything? Phil, I think your replant was the seed corn maggot, correct? Or is that something different? No, that was the same field. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was planted uh, early and then it got really cool and I think it was an organic field so it probably didn't, it wouldn't have had a seed treatment and it may have had manure or something like that on it. And so with this cool weather early, that would have just been those ideal conditions for maggot to attack, especially where uh, there was no high organic matter and, and not like a neonic on, on the seed. Anybody else had replant problems? Is Southwest had to replant or not? Has anybody been out and about? We ended up having some replant, but ours was not seed corn maggot. It was on uh, real heavy soils, and we got more rain, I think, than perhaps most of the state on top of that those cold conditions. And so we've we've got some. Um, it, it's things that are above, uh, you know, in loams that or heavier that have the bigger issues. How much area is that, Bruce? Here, any any estimate? I know Bill called me and he went to our elegant location I believe day before yesterday and we probably need to replant that it's all it's kind of uh, it's kind of hit and miss I think the it depends on how much uh, moisture uh, was in that area and uh, mm -hmm. so you know it kind of follows those rainfall patterns I it's it's not huge but it's it's definitely substantial enough that people are in looking for seed and, and are making those efforts right now the other thing that's uh, going on here just over the last uh, day or so is when we, if you've got a rain, you probably aren't worried about uh, crusting on soybeans. But if you didn't, after those pounding rains from a week ago or so, uh, I think people are starting to rotary hoe pretty good too, which kind of puts us mm -hmm. uh, in, a, in a problem because we're kind of in that crook stage in there where you get the just the hooks coming through. So, yeah. But uh, it's it's definitely it's definitely uh, been a little slow going on some of those that really got pounded with heavy rain. Yeah, we I think we talked about those fields that got planted just before the cold snap, right? Like I think the first we and the first week in May, and they probably avoided the cold temperature, but then yeah, the other pounding rain probably caused the crusting. We we have two fields here on campus that got crusted real bad. We tried to run that uh, planter on top uh, using our RTK system, but it was breaking all those hoaxes. I think Rotary Hope probably will, will do the same thing. It's kind of hard to avoid that the problem. This is Christy. I think there's been a lot of um, spot planting uh, replants as far as drowned out areas. So there were some areas that were pretty, got a lot of rain and there was standing water on a lot of those fields. And a lot of those areas have gotten replanted. Well, the other thing associated with some of that, and I know that uh, Kurt's going to talk about it next week, is that we have have some areas that have really kind of weird colors in different spots, especially on the sandier spots in there. And I haven't decided entirely whether it was either a pre-emergence herbicide issue, uh, nitrogen loss, uh, sulfur loss, or all of the above. But we definitely have some multi-hued corn in some areas, and it seems to be associated with sandier spots in the field. Bruce, I wouldn't rule out um, magnesium deficiency either if it's uh, on really sandy soils. Yeah, I've, uh, that's true. I didn't think about that either in, in there either. So it's, uh, I was in, in parts of Gas County yesterday, so it was, it was uh, down there on, on some of that that is, has a, a moraine, so it has you know, a little bit of everything in the fields, but definitely it was tracking towards the lighter soils. So it's pretty much, I think, mostly in the southwest part, seems like. Christy, what area were you talking about? Mostly central? Seems like what Phil was talking about, that wasn't because of flooding, right? That was an insect issue. My issue was more of a seed corn maggot problem mm -hmm. planted just before that cold weather 
So mm -hmm. it could have been a combination of both seed corn maggot and uh, temperatures. Oh, so. okay. I, I know there was quite a bit of spotting in corn around Shiawassee County, Ionia, uh, a lot of those places where there were some, some areas that were drowned out in fields, you know, that's just typically what happens. So anything else going on in insects or, or weeds, Christy, that we, sh that we should know about? Chris I'm, getting and of, I'm getting a lot of pictures of uh, stuff that I can't believe people are seeing. And I think it's because they're taking more time to like walk the field or I don't know, they're bored and they're just suddenly walking their fields and they're seeing all kinds of things. And it's so, some of these things, it's like, a, it's like, you know, pulling stuff out of my head that I don't remember having to identify for, for a really long time. And it's stuff that I would be able to recognize, but I'm surprised that they're able to see it. So it's kind of cool because I'm getting a lot of uh, a lot of pictures and interesting things to identify. Nothing important from a pest kind of standpoint, but uh, a lot of people are observing stuff. Phil, George Bird here. Hi, George. Uh, let me make a comment about both pearl millet and sudax, okay, from a cover crop and not a forage standpoint. But we've got probably more than 50 years of experience with a sudax for nematode control. And I was very interested this morning in Kim's comments about uh, uh, temperature uh, because uh, we use it a lot in muck soils for nematode uh, uh, control. And there our problem basically has been overgrowth and not undergrowth from a, a temperature standpoint. And that makes some sense to me because of the uh, heat associated uh, with muck soils. Uh, the pearl millet in more recent years has been used as a cover crop uh, uh, for uh, root lesion uh, nematode uh, uh, management. So those are two things that Kim talked about this morning that are very important, not from, well, in addition to the forage, but from a nematode standpoint. Then my third comment, uh, Chris said she was having some problems with graduate students and not wearing masks in the, in the hallway. And in a few minutes, I've got to leave to go pick up some uh, SCM trap crop uh, a seed from a seed company, and I'm taking with me this uh, uh, one-of-a-kind, okay, uh, mask uh, uh, to give as a present to the cooperator. Did that have a Spartan logo on oh, it or something, George? Oh, no, 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 no. This says uh, uh, Michigan, Mich Michigan soybean programs. Oh, okay. Okay, okay gotcha. Yeah, so, you know, um, masks like that could be developed for all those labs and things. I've seen some political masks already too. Uh, <laughs> it's it's pretty interesting what we see out there. So Aaron or Christy, I I've got a question about what are you seeing as far as mare's tail? What what stage are most of the mare's tail in across the state? How long before it's too late to try and control them? Um, I think from what I've seen, it's kind of sporadic. Uh, so we've had some we've got some mares that have some fairly solid stands that uh, would have been about four to six inches tall right now and then we've got a lot of newer planted stuff that um, is probably an inch or less. So it just really kind of depends. So um, I think right now you're probably, if it was coming up this spring, it's probably getting close to that upper limit if you got something to apply to it. So you're thinking like two inches and above and you're, you're pushing the envelope? Well, it depends on the product. I mean, sometimes we can get four to six inch tall mare's tail if you got, you know, if you've got the right products out there to use. So if you're using something like, uh, you know, if you're um, using a Liberty or a Dicamba and some of those different uh, traded products so, or traded seeds. And again, um, with that court ruling right now, we don't know what those implications are going to be going forward with those Dicamba applications. So yeah, and I would just agree. I've, I mean, the tallest I've probably seen is like six inches. I've gotten a few questions about controlling six-inch mare's tail, but the, the stuff around here has been kind of variable, but, but that'd be probably, you know, getting close to the time where we want to be thinking about those applications. So for you weed scientists, uh, I've gotten several calls about rough stock bluegrass really showing up this year. Is that all related to the wet weather that we had a year ago, you think? Or is it just the way it is? It's just getting heavier and heavier concentrations across the state. 
I think it's probably just getting heavier and heavier concentrations across the state and with it not being controlled, you've got the, the seed there. So, um, you know, we can see some pretty solid stands in wheat. Um, Bill, you're probably getting questions on uh, some of your alfalfa yep, issues. Yeah, forages. Um, yeah, so it's, it's definitely something that we need to plan for and it needs to be controlled early because it does go to seed fairly, it matures pretty quickly. Jim, did you see the question about nitrogen rates for summer grasses? Yeah, I just saw that. That depends on the crop and the soil. <laughs> it's going to be really hard to do a blanket recommendation for that. So do you have, you have some ranges? that you normally see or? Well, I mean, just typically for a forage crop, we're typically gonna put on 50 to 100 pounds of nitrogen for something like a sorghum. If you're looking for maximum forage yield, that would be my, my blanket range. But you know, it, you also could have nitrogen credits in play depending on what was grown on the ground previously. Sure. And there's a, a lot of moving pieces to that. But that would be my best guess. I'd, I'd look at putting 50 to 100 pounds of nitrogen on a sorghum or a millet forage crop or equivalent of that with your nitrogen credit and what you have available. Kim, I thought it was interesting when I was in Israel earlier this year that uh, their primary forage is wheat. Of course, we've got wheat that we see here and oats that we have is, that are taken, but not not to the extent, <laughs> excuse me, that, that they do there, and they get really good milk production on it, but their forage percentage in the ration was quite low. I was so surprised. It was around 33 to 35%, and uh, I, I thought that was interesting. They use it all the time, and but we don't use it that much. Is it because the other forages are just that much higher yielding and have better quality? Well, I don't really have an answer for that question. Forage-wise, wheat's probably our lowest yield potential of our small grains might be part of it, but it might just have more to do with the fact that wheat has more value in our system as grain. It's just not something we traditionally think of as forage, but right. wheat, wheat is used a lot as a grazing crop in the southern United States. Sure. Um, it, it, it can have excellent forage quality. In fact, the highest forage quality tests I have ever seen was, was uh, vegetative wheat in a pasture. Extremely, extremely good stuff. <clears throat> Aren't most cereal grains going to run fairly uniform or even as far as the quality side of things? Or is there differences between the different types of forages? Well, when they're in a vegetative state, there's probably not very much difference. Um, but you see more wheat used in the, well, the, w the way it works in the southern system is not really relevant to Michigan, but they use dual purpose wheat down there. They plant it in the fall, winter wheat. They graze it through the winter. They take the cattle off at jointing or first hollow stem, and then they harvest it for grain. So in that system, they uh, actually will get improved grain yield because the grazing encourages more tillering. But the difference there down there is it doesn't rain in the winter. So that type of a, and it's also not as cold, obviously, but that type of system wouldn't work here because if you tried to graze through the winter in Michigan, you'd just trample your wheat into the mud and <laughs> that would be the end of it. But Yeah, when you say increased yield, I mean, we've got guys in the thumb that are going to get probably 125 bushel wheat. They're, they're not even close to that, are they? No. I mean, we're talking about dryland wheat. So, yeah, their, their maximum yield that they get in their system is not going to be the same as what we can get here. But well, that's not irrigated wheat that I'm talking about. In the thumb? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's not irrigated, but you still get a lot more rainfall here than you get sure. in, say, Oklahoma or Texas. All right, I got you. <clears throat> My clock says it's close to 8 o'clock. If there's no more questions or or comments from anybody. Uh, I think we'll go ahead and wrap this up this morning. Thanks for everybody joining in. Marty, it's always good to see you and your your band of uh, of Chilvers there. <laughs> They're waving to us. So I'm going to say goodbye and uh, everybody have a great day.